Half of the patrol interceptors died instantly. Pilots died as they were too shot to jink when their systems blared missile lock or well-aimed laser punctured cockpits through the crew into the void of space. The only reason Milk and Cookie didn't share the fate of their compatriots was because a lucky piece of simulated debris was turned to slag by a laser shot, barely keeping them alive as the veteran pilot turned hard, breaking away from an inbound missile while dumping countermeasures. All wing leads are down, Milk reported, sheer bloody experience keeping her voice from wavering. Tell eight bandits, fast movers. All survivors, focus fire on the 114th, a voice on the radio called, one of the other surviving interceptor pilots. We've got him 30 to 8, we can do this. Her optimism was soon cut short as one of the Adexi pilots blitzed through a makeshift cap line and turned her plane into scrap. The pilot was brilliant. There could be no other way to describe how they flew. Even when moving in a straight line, there were slight bobs and helix flight patterns, keeping them from ever truly staying in the defender's line of fire. Multi-lock missiles under her wings and a modified main cannon informed the Irish WSO that these were planes built for the sole purpose of dogfighting. She didn't even see the normal anti-shipping missile hanging beneath the fuselage. And that gave her a plan. Cookie, pull us closer to the carriers. We need the cover and they can't hit the ships. But the other fleet can. Cookie shot back, even as he began to dance towards the comforting point defense bubble. Some of the other craft tried to follow, trying to get inside the protected bubble of home plate. But they didn't heed Starbucks' rule in their folly. They broke contact and dove back towards home in a straight line, making the already easy shots even easier for the interceptors, dashing in and out of their midst. All around them, simulated debris, panic and explosions, rocked the silence between stars. It was almost beautiful, watching these ships detonate and burn from seemingly nothing, the fires from fuel lines licking the void before being consumed by the deepest darkness. But they couldn't admire the view for long. There was a fight to win. All battles, all wars, all campaigns, and all life is simply momentum being harnessed by some force. Factors compounding on factors, compounding on factors, until all that is left is the end result. The 114th had the momentum of this fight. They struck fast and struck hard with no regard for their own safety, and they made it work. They fought the idea of the enemy, as much as the enemy itself, with their fiery entrance and direct seizure of momentum. Something had to change, or the defending patrol would just be playing to the attack's momentum. Someone had to take momentum, break the beat, and force the enemy to reassess and reorganize. And luckily, someone was ready to do that. Cadet Leroy staggered into her command console as a glancing hit from the orbital bombardment vessel. An energy burst this time, instead of the kinetic kill rods it was saving for the planet or capital ships. Captain, all weapons offline and drones closing, PD is non responsive. Her chief engineer shouted from the weapon tech stand. The bridge had vented the atmosphere a few minutes previously, and the weapon tech hadn't gotten her mask on quick enough. The simulator was insane, Charlie remarked to herself. I could almost feel myself choking. Confirm that, she shouted down. Confirm that all weapons are down. There was a pause. Confirmed. Point defenses 6 through 29 are destroyed, and 1 through 5 are down from EMP. Spinal gun is crap beyond repair. Engines? We got our fucking engines, I doubt anything but a direct hit could take that Roranda out. Then we aren't unarmed, the cadet captain simply said. The Jenkies family were an old merchant family that ran so much cargo, they were given a noble title to run even more, but they never forgot their roots. There's a more space of wisdom, she continues. So long as you've got steering, a prow and thrusters, you aren't unarmed. A grim silence fell across the bridge as everyone waited for the proclamation they knew was to come. All our interceptors are lost, destroyed or picked up by someone else. We are about to die. Let's make sure we take those cunt lickers with us, she shouted, finishing with her finger, flourishing at the kinetic bombardment vessel, and a roar. Helm, give me ramming speed. For better or for worse, sure naval doctrine tends to boil down to near light speed jousting with weapons fired by computer and the crew holding on for dear life. Which meant that even the small ships who would have to stand and fight or get into close range, low speed slugs matches had to be able to reach those insane speeds. Practically, it was a massive tax on the ship's reactor, and the patrol support carriers were more hangars and cargo bays strapped to engines, but at times this was exactly what was needed. As patrol ship 5112005 recovered from the insane damage inflicted by the orbital bombardment craft, the targeting crew of the massive cannon with engines considered it beaten. Drones and interceptors were about to swarm it and tear it to pieces, so they looked away and began locking up a second ship in their sights. That was, of course, until the sensor tech began to scream, Shoot it again! Oh god, I shoot it again! Reflexively, the gunner pulled the trigger of the kinetic slug delivery core gun, sending the 16-ton tungsten slug rocketing down rage 
and towards the patrol ship, screaming towards the bombardment craft. As the two ballistic projectiles met, the ship broke. The weakened hull armor of the patrol craft was completely unable to survive the impact of a Mach 10 slug. About 50,000 kiloton tons of force turned the singular spacecraft into something akin to a shotgun, as a reactor detonation blew the shredded armor and hull into a thousand thousand chunks of shrapnel, moving at a considerable fraction of C. As the orbital bombardment vessel's reactors automatically pushed themselves into the red line in order to refill the capacitors, safeties were momentarily turned off as five power plants roared within the body of the massive flying gun the very moment a spread of superheated shrapnel punched clean through the armor, shredding everything inside. A moment later, neither the crew were in any state to care about the physics. Slivers looked open-mouthed at the suicide ramp her comrade undertook, smashing the keystone of the enemy fleet and throwing radiation and EM static all over the battle space with enough explosive shrapnel to shred the handful of escort frigates that were supposed to be defending the bombardment vessel from assault into an even larger cloud of shrapnel. Unfortunately, the attacker barely scratched the battleship Captain Rochal stood on, watching the sensors flicker and flash from the energy overload. Captain Rochal nodded approvingly for the bravery of the crew who decided death before retreat, turning to watch the flickering screens as interceptor jeweled interceptor between the makeshift skirmish line, aces versus cadets. Flight leader of the 114th Imperial Interceptor Lance thumbed the trigger for her main cannon as her WSO launched her final spread of missiles. The interceptor ahead of her exploded into dust, the pilot believing that sheer speed would protect her from battle hardened targeting reflexes. It was funny, she'd done this plenty of times before. She once served in the Edixie Legions before defecting to the Imperium after seeing the corruption and weakness of the Alliance first hand. It was here she gained satisfaction for her markings as ace. It was an honour to fly for a military, to be given the trust and power of an interceptor craft and told to kill in the name of the service. A true honour, and one of the reasons her flight waited until they finished their two years mandatory service to turn and join the future rulers. They won't call the Empress's truth for nothing. Hearing her voice, hearing the words and promises, they were a siren call for someone who just saw their government join an alliance that sent civilization after civilization into the meat grinder for the faintest edge. The Imperium uplifted these peoples. It was time for the next cadet to fall. She could feel the hum of her black box running, recording everything that happened and allowing the instructors to see who deserves to leave the academy and who needs remedial training. To work shaping and testing the next class of interceptor pilots, who would have thought such a duty could fall to someone as small as her? The flight lead banked away from the explosion and debris and barely had time to process the interceptor that sat clean in her sights was tagged runoff free before a flash of engine light heralded a suicide ram and engine explosion that turned her screen to static. A split second later, the interference died as compensators kicked in to ensure the pilots could see, and the Adixie flight leader of the 114th Imperial Interceptors got another look at her prey. Wait, wasn't the interceptor heading away from them last time she checked? Kuki's hair snapped forward as the interceptor completed his 180 degree flip, lining up the gun sights on the poor bastard who decided to chase him. He squeezed the trigger of the cannon and watched as beams of light flashed out three times and turned the craft that had been ripping through his allies into so much space debris. And then he slammed the thruster forward. Call it, Milk, he says simply, the plan already coalescing between the two. Run it, Cookie, she replied, all business, before clearing her throat and calling out in near mockery of her own accent mixed with a strange shield bite. Scratch one, talky cunt. Come on, your lasses. They're just pilots. If you don't start getting kills, we might take them all down on our own. And that'd just be a shame. Hey, do we get extra credit if we made Ace of a bunch of Aces? While the concept of making Ace during a simulated training exercise was mockable, simulated kills don't count. The words had the intended effect and caused every single enemy interceptor to break off their targets and start heading for Milk and Cookie's craft. Well, we've got their attention. Cookie, what's the plan? Milk asked, preparing the multi-lock missiles and chaff launchers for defensive work as the body was slammed into the crash harness as Milk turned and burned directly towards the debris field. Survive, he replies simply. Mind jamming them up with something good? Milk laughed. I'll see what I can do. Let's see, I think... Shop dress man. E-War with Interceptors is an interesting balancing game. Since every craft has functionality, an E-War suit and operator, anything disruptive doesn't stay that way for long. You can't jam enemy visors when they've got someone who can easily unjam the very same things near instantly. You can't hijack crafts when the pilot can pull the manual control switch and take over from the systems. There's very little that can be done that can't be readily undone. Except, of course, shit-talking. Pilots are cocky bastards at the best of times, 
It comes from the required skill sets and independent thinking needed to create someone who rolls with the punches and improvises without orders. You get the daredevils, the adrenaline junkies and the thrill seekers. You get the bastards, the rabble rousers and the creative. An ancient joke around the Shul Navy was that the original interceptor pilots were death head commando aspirants who couldn't quite pass rifle qualifications. Which means they, to a woman, had some of the sharpest tongues around and weren't afraid of lashing out with them. So the most common E-War technique wasn't hijacking the enemy's fighter, causing his engine to overheat, or taking out his cockpit. It was getting onto their radio frequency and calling them a cunt. One might be surprised how effective that tactic is. Runner Free danced between debris, joking around chunks of metal and taking night impossible turns at muck double digits, riding the edge of G-Lock Threshold, Tunnel Vision almost helping him focus on trying to stay alive while flying through the remnants of battle as seven interceptors, painted with the Empress's sigil, roared after the single craft. Missiles detonated against floating debris, or blocked with flares and Ewar. Laser cannons were barely more useful, as the EM emissions of detonated reactors caused static meters to rise with every shift of power, and threw the individual targeting off. As Cookie came by in a hard turn gun run, Milk noticed that one of the interceptors had popped their canopy shields to let them pilot by and mark one eyeball. It's working, she whispered to her pilot. Watching the battle report showing the Allied Interceptors getting to work keeping suicide drones and ASMs off their home carriers for long enough to seize momentum. They just had to keep up their merry chase going long enough that the fleet could get into a position to help. Milk was sound against her crash eyes again, fighting off increasingly vicious intrusion attempts, or while laughing and shouting insults about the Adixie's parentage, their alignment, and the fleet they served. I mean, come on! She called out, as they kept trying to force off tempo music into their radio transmissions. Empress is truth! What kind of name is that? You sound more like a bunch of librarians. A sharp voice called back. I'll have you know, human, that being a librarian is a perfectly honourable job to possess. Then why are you wasting your time flying interceptors? You'd obviously be better suited sorting books, Milk replied. In fact, what did you kill to make ace? Ducks? I served my nation and fought amongst these stars. Can you say the same, cadet? Milk laughed. Sure I can. I'm Lieutenant Iveen Milk McDermott of the United States Navy Air Corps. I've got 15 combat flights of a hostile territory. I was the chief element of force projection, and fought enemies who were trying to kill me just as hard. Got the shrapnel scars to prove it. How about you, little boy? The Adixie snarled as Cookie slammed a missile into a chunk of debris, sending it spinning and clipping one of their wingmates vehicles, taking the cockpit clean off the body of the craft. I'll get you for that, she shouted at the pilot. Well, we'll try, Milk laughed back, as she watched an arrowhead of friendly markings rush towards the group as Cookie leveled out. We'll certainly try. There was a brief moment of realization, as the Empress's Truth Lance realised that this next fight would be quite a bit different from their first assault. Because rushing towards them, weapons ready, missiles resocked and engines cooled, was twice their number in cadet interceptors. Alright pilots, Cookie said over open comms, as the momentum firmly shifted towards the advantage of the cadets, volleys of fire ripping apart the quickly depleting attacking fleet, with even more of their ships beginning to pull back. Time to earn our pay. On the flagship of the attacking fleet, Captain Rochelle nodded approvingly. Perhaps she did have space on her carrier for these pilots.